So welcome to today's ICAX Youth Talks. So the topic of today is bioelectronics. I'm the moderator today. I'm Mondi Han from Peking University. Uh, so let me briefly introduce the speakers today. So today we have uh, three speakers from three different countries, uh, three different continents, actually. Uh, they are Professor Kim Ha Kwan from KAIST, uh, Professor Alina Rui from TU Delft, and Professor uh, Daniel Franklin from University of Toronto. And we also have a panelist, Professor Wu Binbai from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So uh, the first speaker today is uh, Professor Alina Ray. So let me briefly introduce uh, Professor Ray. Uh, Professor Ray is an assistant professor in TU Delft. She received her uh, undergrad and PhD degree in MIT and postdoc. She conducted the postdoc research uh, in Professor John Rogers Lab at Northwestern University. And she pioneered the, the development of flexible wearable biosensors designed to have a miniaturized size and mechanical softness suitable for fragile populations such as neonates and children. And as a principal investigator in TU Delft, she aims to work at the interdisciplinary fields of precision medicine and chemical engineering, uh, developing biomedical technology in sensing and therapy for next generation medicine. Uh, he published many, many uh, high level papers, including nature medicine, nature biomedical engineering, PNAS, and sense, sense advances. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome Professor Ray for, uh, for, uh, to give his talk, to give her talk. So I will stop sharing and Alina, is yours, the stage is yours. You can share your screen. Thank you so much, Fengdi. Um, So let me share. Do you see my screen? Yes. OK, perfect. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to deliver this talk today on using light to do biosensing. And so today we'll discuss using light to do biosensing in ensemble mode in wearable bioelectronics, as well as in single particle resolution. So let's do this. Um, so a little bit about myself. I did my PhD at MIT, and after that it was followed by um, a postdoc in Professor John Rogers' lab at Northwestern University. And um, since 2020, I am an assistant professor at TU Delft. Now at Delft, uh, what our lab focuses on is the real-time individualized therapy and diagnostics, a field that we term as precision therapeutics. And so the envision is the vision is that from a disease state, we will be able to induce precision ther therapy in which we can have personalized spatial temporal control of drug release. That will be followed by real-time monitoring and to enable early detection and optimize therapy. In today's talk, the focus will be on the, mo on the monitoring, the biosensing part for bioelectronics. And specifically, um, I will be focusing on the use of optical biosensors or the design of opt uh, optical biosensors. So um, for optical biosensors, what we are focusing on is the development of advanced materials for this, uh, for, for, for such biosensing purposes. We want these materials to be soft and flexible. We want to enable real-time detection. And um, in the end, I will also um, demonstrate on how we are going to make this into a single particle or single molecule resolution. And this can be used for different types of um, applications. So um, I'm going to touch upon personalized di diagnostics with uh, wearable sensors as well as um, food and pharmaceutical safety with real-time continuous detection of toxins in a single, single, poly, single particle re resolution. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and go with the personalized, di personalized diagnostics. So um, currently, millions of neonates have to be housed in neonatal intensive care units. And these neonates, they are wired by all types of sensors. These are temperature sensors, uh, res heart rate sensors, respiration rate sensors. And this wired of sensors makes it very, very difficult um, for the caregivers to um, provide their medical care, as well as making it difficult for parents to interact with their child and also for the normal mobile development, neuro, neuro, neuromuscular development of these children. And so with that, our our vision for the future is that can we actually replace these key sensors that are so important for vital sign monitoring with wireless sensors or wireless skin patches? 
such that we can enhance the parent interaction, we can enhance the caretaking quality, ensure child development, while at the same time doing continuous vital sign monitoring for their medical for, 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 for their medical needs. And so um, we've developed a series of sensors. Um, this includes a sensor on the forehead, a sensor on the chest, a sensor on the foot, all with different types of sensing, um, sensing capabilities. For example, heart rate, respiration rate, temperature, motion detection, body position, et cetera. Now, for the in, in the interest of time, today I will focus on our forehead device, which is to monitor the cerebral hemodynamics of, um, of, in this particular case, neonates and children. Now, the technical challenges with um, designing very designing these wireless systems or wireless sensors for such a fragile population as the neonate is that the neonate, they are very, very small. And what that means is that, for example, if we want to put a device on their head, we need to consider that they have a very high curvature of the head. The bending radius is approximately 3.5 centimeters for a 40-week gestational age neonate. And in comparison, an adult's head is approximately 9 centimeters in, 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 in radius. And on top of that, um, the skin of a neonate is very, very fragile because their epidermis layer or their protective layer of the skin is non existent It still hasn't yet been developed or matured. So in that case, that means that the protective function of skin as we know of has not yet been developed. So their skin therefore is very fragile. And so the, the design criteria of such wearable devices for the neonates is that it has to be mechanically soft and it has to be skin friendly. And so this is how we go about with that. Um, first, we start with a uh, field element analysis to, to, to design our system such that our electronic components or our, our, our electronic board can be flexible and stretchable or give as little mechanical stress to the neonatal skin as possible. And so here you can see the main design features over here are our serpentine serpentine interconnects that connect three cru crucial islands. One island for the power, one island for the um, for the micro uh, for, 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 for the microelectronics or the main module of the sensor, as well as um, one for the wireless um, transmission. And so here you can see that in the end, our device can bend, can twist, and um, at a clinical relevant degree. And with that, we then, um, then we also had to encapsulate this. So what we did was with the designed electronic or uh, flexible uh, printed circuit board, we also encapsulated it with a medical grade silicone. And by mechanically coupling it to neonates, you can see here um, a neonate with our device um, on the forehead when it's resting, when it's feeding, and when it's doing um, its neuromuscular development exercises such as tummy time. The, and so um, you can see that the miniaturization of our device um, as well as our low modulus construction and wireless integration can fac facilitate the movement growth and development of the neonate while still continuously monitor key physiological parameters. And now the next is the sensor design. So how do we measure these um, cerebral hemodynamics? So first we measure cerebral oxygenation. This is, um, this is done by um, exploiting the difference of the optical profile of a non-oxygenated hemoglobin, as you can see in the blue line over here, this is an absorption spectrum, as well as the oxygenated hemoglobin, as you can see of the red line over here. So when, when hemoglobin is oxygenated or deoxygenated, they will have different um, optical absorption profiles. And with using this difference, we can then determine the oxygenation profile of a system. Of um, so here you can, and then the, the other, the other uh, type of hemodynamics that we, we are measuring is the cerebrovascular tone. This is important because it can give us a um, idea of the autoregulation response of the cerebrovascular system. 
And so, for example, if you have a normal blood vessel and if it wants to increase the transport of oxygen, it will have a vasodilation. This will decrease the pulse pressure and also decrease the pulse amplitude. So with that, um, in collaboration with Professor Daniel Franklin, who is going to give a talk just, just later, um, he, we, we did a Monte Carlo simulation based on um, the, the neonatal or a real, real MRI scan of a neonatal brain. And so here you can see that uh, with such realistic geometries, we can, we can divide um, this into the different um, layers of, the, of, of, the, of, of, of um, how the light has to penetrate through. So you can see this uh, red or this pink layer over here as a sculpt, and then the skull, and then the cerebral spinal fluid as, or more the green, the, the green blue-ish, and then here you can see the brain. So these are the layers that our light has to penetrate through in order to reach to the neonatal brain. And so with the Monte Carlo simulation, what we got was that the difference in the source, so the light and the detector, these green dots over here, the difference between the source and the light, um, the source and the de de detector dictates the portion of the cerebral and systemic signals. So when I say that is you can see with the shorter distances, the so shorter source detector distances from five to 20, the scalp or the skin um, has a higher pro pro proportion if you have a shorter source detector distance and a lower proportion if you have a longer source detector distance. And then if you want to look at the um, brain, which are the gray, um, gray columns over here, you can see that um, with the higher source detector distance, we also have a higher signal that uh, reflects the oxygenation profile of the brain. So with that, we used all four uh, source detector distances um, such that uh, we will be able to simultaneously monitor the systemic profile as well as the cerebral profile um, of, 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 of the uh, hemodynamics. And so then we used, uh, we did, we did uh, do some clinical studies with this device and um, we, our population was on pediatric patients that had congenital central hypoventilation syndrome. This is a genetically induced autoregulation disorder and how we tested them was with a head up tilt test. Now in this test, the patient is first laid down flat and then it suddenly, and then this bed suddenly tilts such that um, the um, hemo regulation will be off balance a little bit and it will try to gain balance back. And so, so this, this is a little bit similar to um, when you sit down and then suddenly get up, you have the feeling of, the, of dizziness that has a similar feeling with this test. And so here you can see that uh, we, we put our device on the forehead as well as a clinical use device. So the clinical device is the red line over here um, and the blue and our device is the blue line over here. So what you can see is that during the head up chill test, there is a decrease in cerebral oxygenation followed by a recovery period. And um, we can see that both in our, um, in our device and in the um, clinical device, clinically used device. And it has, it shows very nice correlation. So uh, with that, um, we are pretty happy with the performance of our device. And then another test that we did was gas challenge on pediatric patients. In this case, um, we, we gave them 100% nitrogen for seven breaths. So just a very, very short period of time. Um, and so you can see the two drop of the cerebral oxygenation when you do 100% nitrogen. And of course, it's immediately followed by, um, by, 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 by airflow with oxygen so that they can regain that um, cerebral oxygenation profile. But you can see this dip over here. And what we visualize clinically is that normally for a normal person without this CCHS disease, um, you would actually feel that hypoxic environment and you would really struggle. You would really want to breathe and breathe um, to get as much oxygen as possible. But with these patients, they didn't struggle at all. They didn't really feel anything. They were doing their normal thing, reading, drawing, uh, et cetera. And so 
this shows how important it is actually to do continuously continuous monitoring of these um, of, of these patients because just from outside they you would they wouldn't be able to show anything um, anything abnormal but with with but when you measure their cerebrooxygenation actually they are in need of help so. Um, this highlights the, the the case that we really need such a continuous monitoring um, for these cerebral hemodynamics. Okay, and so finally, this is just a clinical validation of a bland Altman plot um, where we take the difference and the mean plot the difference and the mean between our device and the commercialized clinical grade device on different types of patients that we did, including non-CCHS patients and CCHS patients with all types of different tests. For So for example, this is the head up tilt test. This is the normal activity. Um, we challenged them with 100% oxygen with um, different types of um, oxygen car and, and, and um, carbon dioxide feeds, 100% nitrogen, et cetera. So with everything um, found together, what we found was a mean difference between our device and the clinical grade device as 0.06% um, and a standard deviation of 2.3%, which um, the clinicians that we interacted with were very happy with because um, this is within uh, this, this difference will not impact their clinical decision. That's that's a very positive part. Now, um, now in summary, with this part, um, we were able to demonstrate that using um, the design in geometry and material, we can miniaturize these sensors such that it will be neonate friendly. And um, we are, and these are devices that can definitely help the neonates um, in the future. Now I would like to move gears a little bit um, and talk about another uh, application, in this case, uh, food and pharmaceutical safety. So my focus is now focus of shifting to on endotoxin. This is a deadly biochemical and it induces a disease called sepsis or a, a, a condition called sepsis. This is our body's extreme response to infection. It has a 42% mortality rate and accounts for one fifth of the deaths in intensive care units. Um, and 80% of sepsis leading pathogen is based on endotoxin. So that is why currently endotoxin monitoring is mandatory in all food and pharmaceutical products. Now, what is endotoxin? So endotoxin is a component, um, a, lipo, uh, a lipopolysaccharide present in the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. It contains, um, it, it, it is released upon the death and the disparate, uh, disruption of bacteria. And it's highly toxic, as we'd said. It triggers, it triggers the, a, a rapid pro-inflammatory re reaction in humans, causing sepsis shock. And so right now, the gold standard of detecting endotoxin is called um, the LAL assay. It, it is based on the extraction of blood cells from the horseshoe crabs and then in contact with the blood cells with endotoxin, they go through this cascade of um, signaling to cause clotting, to activate a, to activate a clotting enzyme and induce, in, and, and induce clotting. So for example, if you have endotoxin, in this case, you will have a positive gel clot. And if you don't have it, then you do, will not have clot. So the formation of an insoluble gel is then your, 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 um, your detection of a positive uh, in a toxin sample. Now, the there there are a lot of limitations of this assay. Um, it 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 is not able to perform repeated detection. It has ethical concerns because you do need horseshoe crabs, so you need actually to kill the crabs and bleed them. And it has long preparation times due to the multi-step um, of of this cascade reaction. And this is a batch-based me method. Um, so, which means that if you, we want to do continuous endotoxin mo monitoring in the industry, it's very, very difficult. So now there is, that means that there is a need of a new sensing technique for real-time repeatable endotoxin detection for food and for the food and pharmaceutical industry. So our goal is to design a sensing technique for endotoxin that is direct, that is highly specific and sensitive, and can induce, uh, can allow repeatable detection. So what we're, what we're going with now is a phenomenon called plasmon resonance. 
plasmon resonance is the idea that light as an electromagnetic wave can induce the collective os oscillation of electrons within a metal, nano, nanostructured metal. So in this case, um, a, a gold nanoparticle, for example. And um, this, this, um, the, when you couple a gold nanoparticle with a gold nanofilm, what happens is that the, the scattering profile um, induced by this plasma resonance is very dependent on the distance between the gold nanoparticle and the gold nanofilm. So for example, if you have a distance of 20 nanometers and a distance of one nanometer, it is very different um, in, in the scattering optical profile. So for example, here you can see this purple line over here is when the gold nanoparticle and the gold nanofilm are at a larger distance of 20 nanometers. And this red line over here is when the gold nanoparticle and the gold nanofilm are more coupled to each other. Well, so with a distance of one nanometer, you can have a red shift in your scattering profile. Now, this, uh, this simulation is based on the Maxwell, it's Maxwell's equation and me theory. And you can see a vertical shift, uh, a red shift um, of, of, the, of, of, of the scattering profile. And this is, this property is what we're going to use for our further development of the obstacle sensing of endotoxin. Now, how do we control the distance between the gold nanoparticle and the gold nanofilm? Um, we decided to use an aptamer. This apt so an aptamer is a single-stranded DNA or, or RNA, and in this case, it's a DNA. It can undergo conformational changes when it binds to a target. So in our case, when it's unbound, it will be a linear, um, a linear chain. But when it's bound, it will then fold into a 3D configuration that decreases the distance uh, between the gold nanoparticle and the gold nanofilm, thereby causing a red shift in the, in the scattering spectrum. And so um, in order to, to design a sensing technique for endotoxin that, that, that meets our criteria, we, we decided to use a aptamer-based sensor um, and a plasmon sensing component. So um, I will not go over the full chemistry of this, but the main thing is that we started with a gold nanofilm and then we activated the film such that we can functionalize, covalently functionalize our aptamers onto this gold nanofilm and also covalently um, attach our gold nanoparticles. And so the idea is that with, um, with the induction, with the introduction, with the introduced, with the intro, in the introduction of the endotoxin, we can change the, um, the distance between the gold nanoparticle and the, and the gold nanofilm in a endotoxin dependent manner. And this is our result. So here you can see the orange is before incubation and the blue is after incubation. And the scattering spectrum over here, as you can see, we do have a red shift um, after we introduce uh, endotoxin. And so how we quantify this, re this red shift is the red-green ratio. So we take a wavelength in the red, a wavelength in the green, and then just compare the intensities, um, the, the, the ratio of, of intensities in the red wavelength and the green wavelength. And if it's an increase in the red-green ratio, then, um, then, then we assume that it means endotoxin binding. And you can see that here. So with a red-green ratio, if you take the, um, if you take the X scale and the uh, logarithmic scale, you can see that we do have a linear independence between our red-green ratio and our concentration. And so this linear dependence means that we can develop a sensor that is fairly, uh, fair, fairly reliable. Um, and um, and and can give us an an um, a a reliable sent a really re 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 reliable signal uh, of endotoxin based on its concentration. And then finally, uh, we also explored the idea of um, using this for single part particle resolution imaging because you can imagine that with one particle and a uh, one sensing aptamer unit. What happens is that with just one binding event, we can then just monitor one particle to, 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 to monitor that single binding event. So the idea of single particle resolution is that just um, the binding of one molecule will, 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 will be, be able to induce 
the change of one signal. And then we can monitor the change of all of these different signals such that we can do single molecule or single particle resolution imaging. So this is generating one signal from one particle. This is in contrast with the ensemble sensing in which one signal is just generated by a collection of molecules. And this type of uh, technique can, uh, can enable us to understand the individual variability as well as to enhance the sensitivity. And here you can see our results. So visually you can see before endotoxin and after endotoxin, there is a red shift um, on the color of the particle. And this can be quantified in our histogram over here, where before incubation, um, it's more, the red-green ratio is a bit, a, a bit lower, while after incubation, it's a bit higher. And so, 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 so with that, um, we are very excited um, to move this forward um, in, 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 in the single molecule resolution detection. So just as a summary, um, what we develop here um, will, will is, is a aptamer-based um, plasmonic sensing platform composed of a gold nanoparticle and gold nanofilm. And we are using an aptamer to control the distance um, between this gold nanofilm and gold nanoparticle. Upon binding of the endotoxin, we are developing then a sensor that can detect endotoxin real time, continuously, as well as repeatedly. Um, and our goal next, of course, is to try to have this work in real life situations, for example, in complex fluids, um, and to be able to really study the single molecule kinetics um, in, 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 in short time frames. So with that, I would like to acknowledge my team um, and it, my, my team at TU Delft, as well as my collaborators all over the world, um, including Dan uh, from U of Toronto, John in Northwestern University, as well as my collaborators in uh, U of Twente over here in the Netherlands. And thank you so much. I look forward to our further discussion. Thank you, Alina, for the wonderful talk. So we will ask questions after the other uh, two presentations. Uh, so next, uh, let me share my slides. So our um, next speaker is uh, uh, Professor Daniel Franklin. So let me briefly introduce Dan. Uh, Dan uh, professor Daniel Franklin is an assistant professor in the Institute of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Toronto. Um, professor Franklin developed a novel bioresorbable materials, uh, laser systems, and flexible wireless implants and wearables for hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, he has won numerous awards, including the uh, Baxter Young Investigator Award and the, the Displaying Future Award. Uh, Professor Frank Franklin's lab combines optics, engineering, and physiology, uh, physiology to produce medical technologies for commercial translation. Uh, so, hi, Dan. So, uh, I will stop sharing, and the, the stage is yours. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Mengdi. I'll share my screen now. I was confirming that you can see that okay? Yes, yes. Fantastic, thank you. Well, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mengi, also for the invitation and the kind introduction. Um, today I'll be telling you about our uh, work in wearables for continuous hemodynamic monitoring and classification. Uh, to give you a brief overview, uh, I joined um, University of Toronto in 2021. And uh, this year, this is our team. We have nine graduate students and a host of undergraduates um, working on PCB design, validation, uh, physiological testing, and um, many other concepts. But I believe what we're really positioned for is this creation and translation of wearable devices for clinical and real world needs is the main focus of our group. And so we're, we're positioned between in the University of Toronto, where we can develop uh, physiological models, new devices, and the hospital system here in Toronto, which is quite extensive. And we fit in between um, in this little area of translation with the Ted Rogers Center for Heart Research. And so it provides a really good opportunity for uh, not just creating devices, but also then translating them, deploying them um, in patient populations. And so the reason that we're looking into this area is because of the increase of chronic diseases. So one in five Canadians live with at least one chronic disease. 
And many of them live outside of major cities or near major hospitals. So there's this larger concept of telemonitoring that um, individuals should be able to acquire adequate care remotely and at home, as opposed to needing to travel hours to come to a major city, see a clinician, and then go back to their daily lives. So specifically within these chronic diseases, the one that we focus primarily on is heart disease and heart failure. And to give you an idea of what these patients go through, they typically have a major incident which alerts them to the fact that they may have heart failure, right? They have, they have a, um, a difficulty breathing, difficulty walking upstairs, um, you know, uh, various other symptoms. But once they're diagnosed, they are put on uh, medications and they can simply, uh, or, or they can have an increase in quality of life. But it becomes chronic and they constantly have to manage the disease as well. And there's this periodic decreases and at various points, um, hospitalizations. And eventually, once you start getting to end stage, either heart transplantation or, or death. And so our concept relies off of uh, a common one in the field, but through constant intervention, um, daily intervention, you can keep people healthier for longer and help manage the disease. So as opposed to seeing a clinician every six months and having that six month period in between be a black box, essentially for the clinician, um, we can use wearables, use other types of devices to monitor a patient's status in real time. And this has been shown to have real benefits. Um, here also out of Toronto, there's this program called Medley, which is a remote heart failure patient monitoring system, which asks individuals to record blood pressure, weight, what they ate uh, daily. And then this information is fed back to a console where a registered nurse or clinician can then uh, track changes over time and prescribe uh, changes in medication. And so from a, a, a systems point of view, you have this desired patient metric, which is either maintaining a certain blood pressure or a certain biomarker, the clinician intervenes periodically, maybe every six months, patient takes the pharmaceutical and then reacts, and then you, know, you have the actual output. And so if this is, cycle is, is maintaining every six months, there's a lot of time in between where individuals are without care. And so Medley fits by closing the loop in a quicker fashion. Um, however, this Medley program still has uh, downsides. Um, despite being able to reduce hospitalizations by 50%, it still requires patient um, involvement, right, every single day. And so the concept is that can we provide a wearable that can measure blood pressure, classify different individuals based off of their heart failure status, and non-invasively do so so that the patient can live their lives um, without having to be such an active participant in, in these um, you know, software applications. However, the major uh, issue is that the current wearables today are, are lacking um, in providing clinically relevant data. So of all the wearables you know, published from 2021, 2022, um, very few actually go from clinical trials to cardiovascular trials to then FDA cleared products. However, many of these um, can do things like heart rate, SpO2 that you can see on the screen there to the left, um, such as the Apple Watch, uh, Fitbits, and so on, um, activity levels. These are fantastic, and uh, patients are currently using these in their, in their clinical care, but many of them are still limited to those, those systemic factors, and clinicians need more data and more specific heart failure-related data in order to really make in, in, uh, um insightful decisions. So some of these parameters can be a systemic vascular resistance. This is the, the total resistance your heart encounters when pumping blood through your body, blood pressure, which you're common, uh, familiar with, um, and then cardiac output, which is how many liters of blood your heart pumps per minute. And so heart failure can individually impact each one of these parameters differently. And then this involves uh, their classification and then ultimately how the individual is cared for. So our group vision 
is that wearable and implantable electronics will revolutionize chronic disease, but also heart failure diagnosis and management. And so the reason or the, the how we propose this will occur is through novel sensors, um, new types of spectroscopy, new types of, of um, bioimpedance spectroscopy and so on, new physiological models that can make sense of the data that we obtain from these wearables, and then also co-development with end users and knowledge users, the, the patients who have heart failure as well as the clinicians who care for them. And so today I'll be showing you uh, the results of, of one of our recent publications, um, which started in our postdoctoral fellowship at, at Northwestern um, and then concluded at, at Toronto. Uh, and so this is a, a, um, a wearable system a chest patch and a finger patch that combined allow us to not just quantify blood pressure, but also the regulatory mechanisms um, that, that maintain or modify their blood pressure. And so the main reason that we, we chose this system in, is that mean arterial pressure has several different types of wearables out there uh, for real-time estimation. Most of them rely on the pulse wave velocity model. Uh, however, measuring blood pressure alone uh, does not tell you how your body can compensate or regulate for blood pressure. And many people may have uh, heart failure, but then have it be masked by compensation of an increase in vascular resistance in order to compensate, say, for a decrease in cardiac output. And so this really stems from this one equation where mean arterial pressure is equal to cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance that your heart encounters. So this is basically Ohm's law in, in fluid form. They typically disregard the central venous pressure in order to obtain the second equation on the screen. And so just as I mentioned, when someone's um, heart has a reduced ejection fraction, so say their heart is enlarged and that impedes its ability to pump blood efficiently, their body can compensate for a decrease in cardiac output by increasing systemic vascular resistance and therefore maintaining a certain level of, of blood pressure. And so our idea is by measuring or estimating mean arterial pressure as well as cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance, we can see a more comprehensive picture of the patient and begin screening, classification, and other types of, of um, services and additional information that can help the clinicians care for the patients. So as I mentioned, the most common commercial way of estimating blood pressure is this pulse wave velocity model, where you simultaneously obtain an ECG as well as a PPG at a remote peripheral location. And so what you do is you find the time delay between the ECG peak and then when that blood uh, pulse wave propagates down your arm to your PPG location at your wrist or your hand, uh, hand. And that time is related to the blood pressure within that artery. So that's the main uh, mechanism or main physiological concept that we, we estimate blood pressure. However, this has many different assumptions in it. Uh, one of which being that there's no change in the diameter of this vessel or micro vessels along, along the pathway. And so the concept behind this work is to combine this pulse wave velocity model with the measure of this vascular constriction or dilation. And that way we can measure when this model uh, breaks down and therefore improve on it. Uh, and so what we're leveraging here is this idea of surface normal pulse wave velocity where we're using um, biomedical spectroscopy, using how different wavelengths of light penetrate into skin in order to measure the pulse wave velocity from the arteries, the deeper skin, through your arterioles to your, your surface of your skin where your capillary bed is. So multiple types of pulse wave velocity models that will enable us to not just estimate blood pressure, but when basal constriction occurs and when this model may deviate um, in its natural state. So this project, as well as many within our group, uh, leverages this concept of on-skin spectroscopy. So it's one of the most common ways that wearables 
measure vital signs. They use uh, LEDs and photodiodes to quantify blood volume changes. Uh, this is what PPG is, and they typically use only two or three wavelengths of light. So this is a technological advancement from going from two to three, you know, green, red, and infrared, all the way up to potentially 11, 20 to, you know, 100 wavelengths within the size of a wearable. So really driven by technological advances. But the main things that this allows you to do is distinguish between different spectral signatures of chromophores within your skin. So hemoglobin has two main um, species, oxygenated and deoxygenated, but bilirubin, skin, fat, water, they all have their own unique spectral signatures. And so by using on-skin spectroscopy, you can start doing body compensation, uh, body composition estimations or tracking um, uh, different elements. The second approach that spectroscopy allows us to do is the one that we mentioned previously with uh, pulse wave velocity models. So by using the fact that blue wavelengths, green wavelengths penetrate more shallow to the skin, and then red and infrared light penetrates deeper, we can compare these channels and actually physically see a time delay, almost a, a shift in time associated with these two channels and how they propagate into the skin. And this metric, which we'll find later, is going to be correlated with the, the vascular resistance of this, of this uh, tissue bed. And the reason that this is important is because it's actually within these arterioles that blood pressure is really highly regulated. So when your vessels constrict, uh, there's a power of R to the four. So a very small constriction can cause a very large increase in resistance which will then cause a very large drop in pressure. So when your body is, is regulating your pressure, your blood pressure, vascular resistance is one of the main mechanisms within these, within these tissue beds. So this is just a summary of, of what you know, spectroscopy can allow you to do um, in the form of a wearable. Um, but the main clinical benefit is that you can improve the current hemodynamic models by incorporating additional independent metrics when those individual models fail. And this continuous non-invasive physiological monitoring uh, will improve blood pressure estimation, but also classification um, and tracking of a patient, say heart failure state for classification. So these next slides go into a little bit about the engineering behind making some of these devices and the process involved. Uh, typically we start with off the shelf integrated components uh, like this uh, multi-spectral photodiode chip from AMS. We can pair this with a broadband photodiode and use it to obtain uh, up to 11 or 20, depending on the chip, PPG channels simultaneously. So it's a real technological advance over just using two or three wavelengths of light. We then design um, the PCB uh, from the ground up in order to you know, perform the function that we need. So everything from the charging coils, communication, power, microprocessors, this is the main, a main focus of our group and also uh, the group that we um, were postdocs in, in in the Rogers lab. But once it's fabricated, we then program the device firmware. We also have a, a joined um, software application to interface with it. And also a very important step is taking that circuit from a open exposed device to something that can be placed on patients. And so here we, we take uh, molds that are milled out of aluminum and we can then fill them with silbione, which is a, a um, FDA approved silicone, and then sandwich the device in between in order to form hermetically sealed devices that can then be placed on patients or um, various participants. So some of the engineering considerations that, that push this uh, in capability is how there are flexible elements intertwined with rigid elements. So on the, the slide, you can see the PCB there, we have these serpentines in between these islands, and then the islands have the various integrated circuits with it. 
So this affords us the opportunity to create stretchable, flexible, conformable devices that can be minimally um, invasive to the individual or patient. And so here's just a few images showing us stretching, flexing device with the device still operating. And so in conclusion, we have these now assembled fully wireless devices that can charge um, with, with wireless charging platforms and communicate via Bluetooth to software applications on um, a smart device. So the next step is then validating these devices in their use case. And so uh, in this work here specifically, we had a combination of in lab on healthy individual studies, as well as in the clinic with heart failure patients. And so I'll show you some of that data now. So as I mentioned, the main idea is that we're combining this pulse arrival time or, or, or pulse transit time model with this multi-wavelength delay, which is another pulse wave velocity model, but orthogonal to the skin itself. And what's interesting is that there's certain pressors or, or stimuli that we can ask individuals to do where the, each model has different strengths and, we, and, and weaknesses. So for example, I mentioned that the pulse wave velocity model uh, is an estimation of blood pressure. So for certain stimuli, for Valsalva maneuvers or ice bath or hold breath, this may hold well or may break down depending on the assumptions of the underlying model. So here, for example, during Valsalva's, I've highlighted um, that section. You can see that the, the pulse Arrival time decreases and our blood pressure increases. And so it seems to hold well, but for our multi wavelength delay measurement, you can see that the response is, is either not there or minimal. So this, this uh, basically shows that a large change in systemic central pressure may not have a big impact on your, your regulation of blood flow within your microvessels, right? But however, whenever you have a change in those microvessels, that still has a large impact on your blood pressure, as you can see down below and highlighted by the green circle. So sticking your hand in ice water will cause a big change in blood pressure increase as your skin and uh, microvessels constrict. However, that's not captured well by the pulse wave velocity model, the PAT model at the very top. And so you can see here that there's two different circumstances um, where one model works and then the other breaks down. So the idea is that by combining these into a, a, a time synchronized model, you can then account for these errors and create a better comprehensive system. Now, the main reason that we chose these pressors like a Valsalva or ice bath is that they'll correspond with different um, clinical uh, correlate or cl clinical outcomes or clinical situations. So going outside uh, you know, in Toronto during winter may elicit this response, but someone going into shock or someone being prescribed a pharmaceutical may also experience vasoconstriction in the same fashion. Another uh, interesting um, set of experiments that we performed show even a difference in the directionality of the models based off of, of uh, different vasoconstrictive or dilative effects. So here we have uh, one experiment to show a sauna. So during a sauna, the idea is that our vessels will dilate and allow blood to reach the surface of our skin and allow heat to shed out into our environment, right? To try to, to regulate our temperature. So we would expect that the multi-wavelength delay would then decrease. And when we measure blood pressure as well, there's a decrease in blood pressure. However, our pulse arrival time model, because the underlying assumptions don't account for vasoconstriction or dilation, we actually see a decrease in PAT as well in a situation where there should be an increase. Now during exercise, uh, it's a more traditional response where the PAT decreases, the blood pressure increases. And because we start sweating as well and we're generating heat, we need to dilate in order to regulate our temperature. And so multiple length delay decreases. But this just shows the situation where pulse arrival time decreases in both of these events, but blood pressure goes in opposite directions. 
And so right away, there's an issue with our model or this concept that, that pulse rival time correlates with blood pressure well. And so again, the whole idea is that by combining these multiple physiological models, we can overcome any limitations of a single one. So one of the last things that we performed uh, within this uh, study was to aggregate all of our data sets. So the ones you saw previously in the slides, but also those of 10 healthy subjects. Um, we had 20 hypertensive patients, and then also uh, four patients that were performing or that had mitral valve um, post-surgical vasopressors performed. We aggregated all this data together to see how we could classify or how we could visualize the patient status based off of this, this two-dimensional space of peripheral resistance and blood pressure. So not just blood pressure, but also one of the mechanisms by which it's regulated. So what these clusters can allow us to do is then create different classification models. So it could be uh, you know, nearest neighbor, um, in, you know, random forest matrix, uh, basic classification models. We, we didn't apply um, complex AI models like neural networks um, yet, but this is just to show that even with just these, these fundamental data sets, you can use rather basic classification models to differentiate what an individual is doing. And so here's a confusion matrix um, based off a random forest model that we performed to show when our device, just by looking at heart rate, EAT, and this multi-wavelength delay, can classify what the individual is doing or what the status of the individual is. So whether cold presser, sauna, whether they're undergoing surgical pressers, exercise, and so on. And you can see that they they quite well align uh, for, for most of the uh um for most of the classification, the uh, most of the classes, except for maybe the breath hold here, which is being confused with baseline a little bit. Um, but one of the the more important things in my opinion is not just you know creating a device that can performance classification, but also seeing what the value of each of these measurements is ultimately in the end. So we perform a shapely uh, analysis to, to see for each different classification or class, which metric is the most important in that classification of that class. And so you can see for baseline, breath hold, and so on, um, but maybe pointing a few out, you know, the cold presser was a scenario where the multi-wavelength delay had a very high correlation with blood pressure where the PAT did not. And here you can see that the green line is, is higher than it as well. But when we performed Valsalva, we saw the opposite, right? Where the PAT model was showing a correlation, but our multi-wavelength delay was showing little to nothing or a flat line. And so you can see that represented here in the significance. So multi-wavelength delay of the Valsalva in the bottom uh, um, bottom middle graph shows a really low additive value compared to, say, heart rate or, or pulse survival time. So in conclusion for this uh, model, we proposed a, a new multi-wavelength time delay measurement of arterial pulse transit time that corresponds with systemic vascular resistance and it could potentially lead to a correction factor for EAT models based off of ECG and pulse transit time. And so whenever there is vasoconstriction or dilation, we can measure that and take it into account. Um, ultimately, our goal is to translate this to remote environments. And so we hope that these devices will, will allow greater classification. Um, but there are future work that we're anticipating that will improve upon it. Um, as we showed previously, we had a kind of a two-dimensional plot of peripheral resistance and blood pressure. However, this equation that you see there, mean arterial pressure, cardiac output, and SVR, has cardiac output. There's, there's three elements in here as well. And so in our future directions in Toronto, we're aiming to improve upon this uh, concept by adding a third dimension of cardiac output to our measurements as well. So having multiple uh, time delay, EAT, 
and not just heart rate, but cardiac output in order to classify uh, an individual state. And what some of these devices look like um, are shown here. And it, it's, it's rather uh, exciting that some of these are already commercially available. So this is a, a reference design from Maxim Integrated, which was acquired by Analog Devices. But it's a chest patch which can perform all three of these measurements in real time. So cardiac output, ECG, uh, they perform that through bioimpedance spectroscopy. They can also perform PPG. And so if you were to take this instead of a chest, put it on your arm, you could perform pulse rival time models. And these are some of the things that we're exploring um, to help advance this uh, into the future. And maybe also just to show you some of the other applications or, or things that we're tackling, um, in translating these devices into home environments, there are many other challenges that you can imagine. Uh, variations in skin tone can impact how our optical measurements are being obtained and our interpretation of them. And so we have projects looking at the impact of skin tone on various um, you know, vital signs obtained through these wearables. Uh, a really big impact and a practical problem is motion artifacts. Anytime that there's motion, uh, a disturbance to the wearable or the skin the wearable's on, uh, that will directly impact the data we obtain from it. And currently, these devices will, say, measure with an accelerometer when there's motion and then disregard the data that's obtained at that same time. And so we're, we're looking at other approaches that will help us reconstruct their uh, measurements. And uh, these are just a few examples of, of um, the ideas that we have in treating ischemic chronic diseases like heart failure, but as well as tackling some of the practical problems that are involved in, in translating them and putting them in home environments. And so with that, I think I'll actually skip ahead uh, looking at time to uh, my acknowledgement slide, just thanking our team. Um, and also, you know, Andreas uh, Bellius and, and John Rogers, with which uh, the, the main bulk of the work was done at, at Northwestern and uh, Toronto. Okay. Thank you, Dan, for the very insightful talk. So we will ask questions later. So if you could stop sharing your slides, then I, I will share, share my screen. Uh, so let me introduce our uh, last speaker today. So our last speaker is Professor Ken Ha Kwan. Uh, she is an assistant professor in School of Electrical Engineering as well as a joint professor in the Department of Semiconductor Engineering and the Graduate School of AI Semiconductor at KAIST. Um, her research interests span a wide range of topics in wireless communication, bioelectronics, and battery management systems. She is an active technical pro uh, program committee member of IEEE ISSCC, which is the uh, flagship uh, conference in integrated circuit. And she also you know, ser serves, served as the country representative of Korea for the ISSCC Far East region. And since 2023, she has held the position of Quan O Huin in the professor. Uh, so for those who uh, don't know Quan uh, Huin. I will tell you that he is the former chairman and CEO of Samsung Electronics. Uh, so without further ado, let's welcome Professor uh, Ken Hao Kwan to give us the presentation. So I will stop sharing. So Ken Hao, you can begin sharing your slides. Okay, um, thanks for the invitation and kind introduction. Today, I will be discussing the role of wireless technologies in shaping digital healthcare. Recently, COVID-19 ha has highlighted the importance of new medical technologies, especially in non-contact remote patient monitoring. In this slide, we see various wireless medical devices that enable remote monitoring. These include devices like cardiac monitor, sweat analysis, and skin diagnostic platforms. 
These devices collect health data such as blood flow, pressure, heartbeat, poor body temperature, hydration, and sweat biomarkers from users. This data is then transmitted wirelessly to user interfaces, such as smartphone apps, enabling continuous monitoring without the need for direct contact. In addition to those wearable and implantable devices, users can transform their smartphone into a mobile lab for real-time diagnostics and digit surveillance. This low-cost user-friendly platform enables mobile testing at the point of need for healthcare and home use or for disease tracking, such as in mobile clinics. Those collected data is then uploaded to the cloud, where it is processed or analyzed via data warehousing or big data processing. This enables physicians or hospitals to remotely monitor patients and respond as needed. Here, AI-powered health and wellness monitoring further enhances this medical ecosystem, playing a critical role in managing infectious disease and advancing digital health care. The current market provides a variety of wearable devices, but they generally have a primitive level of biointegration. They often consist of a rigid block of electronics that loosely strap to the wrist. However, in order, in order to digitize human signals accurately and comfortably, we need to overcome the mechanical mismatch between the soft human body and rigid electronics. This requires transforming the electronics into more biocompatible forms. Therefore, our research centers on developing and verifying flexible medical devices that simply adhere to the human body. In this talk, I will explore some soft, small medical devices that can wirelessly measure cardiac function, skin hydration levels, and other dynamics. Let's begin with cardiac monitor. This slide introduced the Sapien heart valve and Huan Gens catheter. This Sapien heart valve in here is the first FDA approved device designed to replace replace defective heart valve. Alongside this, this Swan Gens catheter is the gold standard for monitoring hemodynamic function during cardiac procedures. For patients with prosthetic cardiac valve or those experiencing mal malfunctions, continuous monitoring using this Swan Gens catheter is essential to ensure proper valve function. Thus, for those patients, the catheter is inserted through a large vein and navigated into the pulmonary artery, and its output ports are connected to an external monitor that displays vital information about blood flow and pressures around the heart. This setup requires a wired connection to this stationary monitor, thereby limiting its use for stationary monitoring. Thus, we aim to develop more patient-friendly solutions that provide the same level of monitoring without the constraint of wired connections. In order to provide cardiac variables in a wireless manner, we developed wireless cardiac monitor. Such a technology can be supported by two main subsystems. The first one is an implantable biosensor with a base station for wireless power receiving and data transfer. And the wearable wireless power transmission platform, including primary antenna, charging board with a portable battery, and the user interface, such as smartphone. This base station will receive power from the wearable primary antenna, read the resistance of biosensors, and transmit blood flow, pressure, temperature measurement to smartphone via Bluetooth low energy communication. This slide shows the block diagram of the entire system, consisting of implantable and wearable parts. First, implants consist of a silicon nanomembrane biosensor to measure blood pressure, blood flow velocity, and core body temperature, and a Bluetooth low energy system for wireless communication and control and the power management circuit 
for wireless power receiving from outside the body. Then the wearables consist of wireless power transfer module to wirelessly transmit power to the implant and a customized user interface like smartphone for data storage analysis and display. In this talk, I will briefly cover the design feature and operating principle of biosensors and then look into the wireless module and clinical study. First, the biosensor provide flow, pressure, and temperature measurement. First, the flow sensor includes a silicon nanomembrane register in the middle of this 3D pop-up structure. Then forward and backward flow leads tension and compression on this register, thereby inducing the increase and decrease in resistance respectively. Then for pressure sensing, a silicon register mounts on a micro-sized air cavity. Then external pressure deforms the register to stretch toward the inside the cavity and consequently change the resistance value. This slide shows the characterization results of our biosensing module. On the left, we have the finite element analysis result for the flow sensor strain under bidirectional flow velocity. This graph illustrates how the sensor responds to forward flow and backward flow, highlighting the strain on the sensor in each direction. Then this middle graph depicts the FBA result for the pressure sensor. It shows an increase in sensor strain as the applied pressure ranges from 5 to 140 millimeters of mercury, indicating the sensor sensitivity in measuring pressure changes. On the right, we have the measurement result for the temperature sensor. It shows an increase in sensor resistance as the temperature ranges from 30 to 50 Celsius degree. These results underline the effectiveness of our biosensing module in accurately capturing and responding to blood flow, pressure, and temperature. This wireless module includes biocompatible encapsulation layer, off-the-shelf electronic component, and a copper PI copper sheet processed with a laser cutting tool to yield a thin flexible antenna coil and circuit traces. That interconnect a pair of supercapacitor power management module comprising of diode bridge rectifier and charge pump converter. Then this BLE system on a chip and the Wiston bridge circuit. The thin flexible encapsulation layer shown here made of silicon elastomer, which include multiple eyelets for suturing the platform to the animal body. And the encapsulation lasts more than a month in saline solution at the temperature of 80 Celsius degree, which means that it guarantees complete isolation from biofluid more than half an year at the human body temperature. The wireless module subconsciously inserts between fat and dermis layers to harvest power through um, RX coil and to transmit data to an external user interface via BLE protocols. In this way, the combined use of this wireless module and the biosensor provide a user-friendly and easily accessible method for rapid detection and characterization of hemodynamic instability of individuals peri, intra, and post-cardiac surgery. This slide represents the circuit and block diagram of the wireless module. First, this receiver coil, resonant at 13.56 MHz, allows wireless power receiving from the outside primary transmission antenna. Then, the receive voltage on the resonant coil is rectified with a full bridge rectifier and regulate it using a charge pump converter to simultaneously power the BLE system and the pair of supercapacitor. This supercapacitor operate as a short-term energy buffer during some period with an angular mismatch between the receive coil and the primary antenna, which can be caused by an unexpected motion of the animal. 
This wireless charging occurs within seconds when the transmitting antenna are put around one watt. Then this per capacitor can power the entire system for more than five minutes without external power source. The remaining circuitry consists of the Bluetooth low energy system on chip for wireless communication and control, and this bridge circuit to measure the resistance changes of this biosensor. Here, this central processing unit controls the GPIO pin to supply voltage on this bridge circuit only at the moment sampling occurs for ultra low power operation, and then transmit this analog to digital converter sampled data to user interfaces. Benchtop studies used sensing modules inserted into the pulmonary artery extracted from pigs, which have similar vascular system to those of humans. Here, um, 3D printed dental resin platform with raised features, this wing, protects the 3D flow sensor from mechanical damage during implantation. And this surgical clip helps mount the module inside the artery wall as shown below. This block diagram describes the artificial heart system with two cylinders labeled as RV and RA and two prosthetic heart valves labeled as PV and TV and the commercial flow and pressure sensor. This cylinder with a mechanical pump that replicate the um, mechanical action of the right ventricle induces flows into the pulmonary artery through a mechanical valve that, that replicate the mechanical function of the pulmonary valve. The flow through the sensing module and commercial sensor in turn passes through a cylinder that replicate the right atrium and an additional valve right cuspid valve. Our wireless system harvests power from the wireless power transmission module and transmits the measurement to a BLE-enabled smartphone that displays continuous real-time waveform of flow pressure data and records the data on its secure digital memory card. Figures here display continuous 200 hertz data corresponding to pressure and flow rate, respectively. Measured from a traditional wired system labeled as PCOM and FCOM with black color, and from the wireless system labeled as PBLE and FBLE with blue color over a 10 second measurement interval. We can observe that our wireless system has consistent result compared to the traditional wired system. Clinical study involved the implantation of biosensors in the aorta or pulmonary artery and the wireless module underneath the skin for chronic evaluation of heart valves. The smartphone and the wireless power transmission platform can locate in this pocket of a custom animal vest. For demonstration, we've implanted biosensors in the pulmonary artery, as shown here, and placed this wireless module underneath the skin. Then the primary antenna, wired to a portable battery, provide a wireless power to the wireless module underneath the skin, and the PLE-enabled smartphone collected flow and pressure measurement at a sampling rate of 100 Hz. This slide shows measurement of pulmonary artery pressure labeled as PAP from the wireless heart monitor labeled as PBLE with blue color and the commercial PA catheter labeled as PCOM with a blue black color. The value of PBLE agree well with the values of PCOM. The results show physiologically meaningful waveform as shown here where the upstroke represents ventricular contraction and culminate at the systolic peak, which correspond to the systolic blood pressure. Then as the ventricle relaxes, its pressure decreases 
resulting in closure of the valve and generation of a reflected pressure represented by the dichroic notch. For more details, please refer to our paper published in Nature Biomedical Engineering. The following slide will cover the skin hydration sensor monitoring for flap health. A uh, flap is a uh, healthy skin or tissue for skin transplant to enable surgical repairs or reconstruction of damaged skin or deep dermis tissue. So the idea of using our device is to monitor the flap closely and continuously after transferring the flap to the recipient site, which can provide feedback in a real-time fashion for the surgeons to reduce the risk of flap necrosis and for the patient to monitor recovery at home. However, the main disadvantage of the commercial flap monitor is that it requires a wired connection to a stationary monitor and a well-trained medical staff. So we introduced a uh, the small skin diagnostic device that simply adhere to the surface of the skin and provide automatic non-invasive measurement of thermal transport properties of the skin using a thermal actuator and precision thermistors. Here, the wireless platform configured with a resistive heater and precision thermistor by a serpentine structure to achieve an intimate interface with skin. Then using a smartphone, users can enable BLE connection to the device and activate this GPIO to force a periodic current into the resistive heater. Then this applied current generates a um, constant thermal power and delivers the heat to the skin below. Then, Transport of heat from this actuator to the thermistor depends upon the thermal properties of the skin, meaning that healthy skin or flap with an appropriate amount of moisture shows a small delta T, while dry or damaged skin exhibit a large delta T, and thus delta T measurements serve as the basis for the measurement of skin hydration or flap health. Figure on the left shows the continuous measurement of temperature wirelessly acquired from the device, where delta T denotes the temperature difference measured 10 seconds before and after turning on the heat. Then figure on the right represents delta T measurement using different materials and skin parts, including air, silicon, arm, forehead, and water. It is clearly shown that delta T decreases as the thermal conductivity or hydration increases. As a result, delta T can determine an effective thermal transport characteristic. In other words, skin hydration level using computational models and some calibration procedures. Um, exploded view illustration highlight the constituent layers and components, including encapsulation layers, battery, and flexible circuit traces that interconnect the BLE system on chip, thermistors, and thermal actuator. This top in-cap layer configures with um, air pocket around the heating and sensing element to achieve thermal insulation. The commercial devices for measuring skin hydration require care by the user to hold the proof and manually apply a certain fixed pressure against the skin for a few seconds for each measurement, which results user variability. However, in our design, soft contact to the surface of the skin with almost zero user burden. It's recording that can be quantitatively connected to hydration levels in skin with high levels of repeatability. This miniaturized flexible platform can be used on nearly any part of the human body, including small hand on a pediatric subject. 
This slide shows the result for skin hydration level measured by three users at five different body locations, including forehead, left, left and right arms, and left and right leg. The result measured by the BLE platform with red color correlate with those from two other commercial devices and yield the most repeatable values of skin hydration levels. Clinical trial involves monitoring the mounting the platform on the back of the hand with atopic eczema and the forearm with healthy skin. This optical image shows the platform on the atopic eczema of the subject next to a smartphone to collect this place or the measurement. Compared with the healthy skin, atopic eczema show low value of skin hydration levels and an increase in hydration level after applying moisturizer as expected. Our collaborator were of Verify are preparing to commercialize this platform after obtaining FDA approval in the United States. To validate the product, data from over 100 patients was collected and the results were featured in advanced healthcare materials. Although the appearance is similar to the previous version, there are two key improvements. First, we made this interconnect around the heater and temperature sensor thinner, which are the main sources of heat loss in thermal sensing. This change, this change improves sensitivity. Then, to reduce user variability caused by the degree of adhesion when attaching the sensing area to the skin, we added an applicator. Then, pressing the top of this imprint, apply consistent pressure across the entire outline of the device. In traditional clinics, doctors use visual assessment to classify skin hydration levels into four stages, normal, mild, moderate, and severe dry. We conducted experiments on over 200 patients using this method and our proposed platform. And the results showed uh, High co correlation between the two methods. Another application of this platform is to monitor wound healing by measuring moisture and temperature of post surgical area. Here, our platform measures moisture and temperature that affect healing pro progress and use those parameters as indicator to track tissue recovery. This platform consists of seven sensors covering the affected area with a heater located at the opposite side of the center sensor. This heater periodically applies heat and the temperature changes in the affected area are monitored. By interpolating the result across the entire area, we can monitor changes in the affected area in real time. The device has been validated on both diabetic and healthy mouth models. A key feature of this device is the use of biodegradable temperature sensors. So in the future, this biodegradable sensor can be further adhered to or inserted into the affected area for monitoring. After the monitoring period ends, the sensors will naturally dissolve and dis disappear. Let's conclude the main point. Our research aims to transform emerging technology, including advances in areas such as sensor network, mobile communication, and bioengineering, in order to provide digitalized healthcare, those flexible wireless electronics, and cost-effective user interfaces digitize human signals continuously and conformally thereby bridging temporal and spatial gaps in healthcare system between rich and poor countries. In the future, medicine and healthcare will be digitized and nearly invisible continuous and wireless medical devices will be a big part of this digital revolution. I wanna to thank to our collaborators. Thanks for your attention today. Thank you, Kyung-ha, for the wonderful talk. Uh, so 
if you could stop sharing your screen, then I will uh, share, share my slides. So uh, as an update, so now we are having more than 10, uh, 12,000 people watching the presentations online. So after the three talks, we will have panel discussions. So first, let me introduce uh, the panelist today is Professor Wu Binbai. So Professor Wu Binbai obtained a bachelor degree in physics from the USTC uh, in 2011. He received a PhD degree in MIT, and then he conducted postdoctoral research in John Rogers Lab at Northwestern University. Uh, he is currently an assistant professor in the Department of, of Applied Physical Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His lab focuses research on heterogeneous integration of soft materials and nanomaterials to design and develop devices for healthcare. So then, so for all the speakers and uh, uh, panelists, uh, please uh, open uh, open your video and then we can begin our panel discussion. So. Oh. So we'll be, uh, how about you go first to ask some questions? Actually, I have many, many questions, but I will let that will be to uh, start the discussion. That's good. Uh, thank you, Mundi. Uh, same here. I also have a uh, uh, questions. Uh, so it's very inspiring talks and uh, always uh, since we're doing post -all and we also got inspired from uh, from all of you uh, as well. Uh, so uh, probably I, we will start with uh, a general questions. Uh, uh, we notice uh, all your uh, newly developed devices target a wide range of uh, uh, targeted population of patients. Uh, so I wonder uh, when you uh, establish the products, how uh, do you build the connection between your technology uh, with your uh, population? How did you find the perfect match? Uh, what, what's, how did you make that happen uh, for all the three speakers? Maybe, maybe I can start first. Um, so um, thank you so much for this well thought out question. Um, and I do think it's really important when we develop our technology to engage with the end users um, at the very beginning. And so um, from our end, this engagement actually started with clinicians. So it it, it is the clinician who actually um, know the need of the patient group. And so from there, we then discuss with the clinician on, okay, so what are the requirements? What are the use cases? And um, for example, in our case, we needed materials that are very neonatal safe. And so in that case, like what are the caregivers comfortable with? Um, so that discussion was initiated at the very design stage of the project in order to understand exactly what the end user's needs are so that we can optimize our design towards that direction. Okay, so how about that? Do you have any comments? Or yeah, opinion? absolutely. No, I, I, I think what Alina uh, highlighted is definitely uh, probably the best way of going about it, you know, starting with the clinicians and the patients and then seeing what they need and what technology can best fulfill that role. I think the other approach that we can sometimes be um, lured into as engineers, right, is that we, we have a hammer and we're looking for a nail. Like I, I, I'm guilty of this as well. Like the technology is so cool nowadays with what these chips can do. That, for example, with mine, like with spectroscopy, there's some now that can do 64 wavelengths all within you know five millimeter by five millimeter little space. And it, you can try to make the best uh, technological advancement, but it can be difficult to match that with the clinical need. That you know is the perfect hammer and nail pairing. And so, I. Uh, I agree with Alina. I think it's definitely best to start with clinicians and, and listening to what they need, and then being a little bit um, flexible. You know, don't 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 be married to the one type of measurement that you're familiar with. You know, try to incorporate what will best uh, meet the need. Yeah. So, uh, do you have any opinion to share with us? I think it's important to attend event where many clinicians participate, presenting my technology and networking with them. Through such opportunity, by engaging in discussion with clinicians, I can learn about the front issues faced in the medical field and 
collaborate with them to develop my platform to help patients or clinicians. Yeah, I totally agree. I think we must frequently discuss with the clinicians and also present them what we can do. And uh, sometimes they are not interested in all of our techniques, but for example, I present 10 techniques, they are interested in one, then we can begin the collaboration and we can find a very you know, significant uh, things to do. I think uh, that, that that's an important thing for us to discuss with the clinicians. Agree, yeah, totally. And uh, then uh, a more uh, technical question, probably this is more uh, towards uh, Dan, is uh, so the uh, multi-spectrometer uh, wearable devices, uh, it, it's uh, uh, quite powerful. Uh, so I, I wonder, uh, so uh, when you design the devices, uh, so the choice of those wavelengths or the number of those wavelengths uh, uh, has to be matched with a certain uh, clinical needs or uh, so this is uh, explorations about, uh, uh, so try to maximize uh, the number of wavelengths and see how, uh, what will be the potential of this. And, uh, uh, so then uh, also uh, for all those wavelengths, are they uh, equally utilized uh, for uh, those uh, uh, clinical parameters uh, you have been uh, uh, studied? Or yeah, or how would you, uh, what is the exploration uh, among these uh, connections? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, for the on-skin spectrometers, it, it depends on the, the engineering approach I think you start with. So. Those integrated circuits that we use off the shelf, we are, are limited in a way to what they are made with and what they can do. And the, the company makes them for a range of applications. I think off the shelf, it's meant to be an ambient light sensor for a smartphone uh, in its actual you know, marketing case. But we, we took it and repurposed it for biomedical spectroscopy, for example. So in, in those cases, you have very limited options in terms of, you know, you can use this chip or that chip and they have their wavelength sets. And so you can pick which ones you think would be the most relevant. Um, but exactly what you asked is, is one that we get asked a lot of, of, are all these wavelengths necessary, right? And, and which ones are the best or the most necessary? And, and for me, that's one of the main scientific questions that we're trying to address. Um, the same way that we were applying like the shapely analysis to find the significance of, you know, heart rate versus pulse arrival time versus our, you know, more experimental measurements, we can do the same thing by subsampling our data set itself and then actually answering you know this is the value that blue you know 450 nanometer light gives you that you know green doesn't or or can you actually do it all with two or three wavelengths of light and if, if that's the case that's, that's the way the science goes and i mean i think it also has a, a cool impact just because if you can uh show your technique with a smaller wavelength number it could be used potentially in all smart devices out, out there currently, right? If a smartwatch is um, currently only using two or three wavelengths of light. So I think there's pros and cons um, to that. I think one of the other main approaches um, doesn't use these, these uh, integrated circuit chips that have these Faber Pro filters and, and different wavelength selected photodiodes, but actually uh, is, is a really complex analog front end, which is mostly what PPG systems use. And so nowadays, those can go up to I think thirty-two wa wavelengths. I think from a new a new analog uh, devices chip can do thirty-two LEDs, and those are agnostic. You, you can connect those to any LED you want, and so I think that's a pretty cool opportunity to explore that idea of um, you know how many are really necessary for your specific application, and then trying to find out the the optimal system that could then be translated to say a commercial product that doesn't go off the walls in terms of wavelengths, but actually uses exactly what you need and is the most efficient for it. Hi, yes. hi Wubian, can I follow up a question on the wavelengths yes. also for that? Uh, so if I remember correct, I don't know if I remember correctly. So initially I remember, uh, initially when you proposed this uh, project, you proposed to use white LED, uh, but later when you published the paper upon, oh, there are multiple different LEDs. So what's the reason that you change white LED to multiple LED with different wavelengths? Yeah, so it, the paper has a white LED, but the white LEDs still only produce light out to maybe 700 nanometers or so. 
So it doesn't produce light over a full spectrum. Exactly, because oh, nice. the, the, the white light LEDs are essentially blue LEDs with yellow phosphor on them, and then the the, the yellow phosphor only produces light at about seven hundred nanometers. So if you want to measure uh, infrared wavelength like eight hundred or nine hundred, we needed to add one little uh, infrared LED as well. And so the final device has two LEDs: one one broadband one, and then one infrared one to to um, fill that area. But they are making advances in, in those technologies as well. Like uh, there, there are broadband infrared LEDs nowadays as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of a lot of cool things to explore. So in that case, you only need one LED. Yeah, LED. I, I guess with, with this um, construct or, or system, like you, you would need um, either one or several LEDs to basically span all the the wavelengths you want to sense. And I see. Whatever's out there on the market is what you can try to find to do that. I see. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Uh, then probably uh, another brief uh, uh, follow-up question would be uh, the calibration models. Uh, so you mentioned uh, you also compare three different models, and they show different performance at different variation uh, situations. So uh, I wonder uh, how would you uh, think of the uh, the current uh, status of uh, those massive mo models uh, in the uh, Wearable monitoring it is uh, established, or there's uh, still uh, uh, imperfect uh, to uh, implement uh, practically. Um, I, I think it. So it depends on the use case ultimately. Like if your if your goal is to say a clinically relevant system, it's going to have a higher bar, right, mm -hmm. of, of error. Um, and you can see this nowadays with like pulse oximeters as well. There's separate categories. There's over the counter mm -hmm. pulse oximeters, and then there's clinical. Pulse oximeters, and so I, you know, my, my opinion of, of the over-the-shelf or over-the-counter um, blood pressure or, or pulse ox systems is that they can show you trends, but yeah. their absolute value may have a high degree of error in them. And I think right. what we showed through the paper is that even depending on what you're doing, the trends may not show up either, which is the alarming thing. So. I think that there's a, still a lot of room for improvement when it comes to these models. And uh, I think the, the one approach that we're taking to overcome them is by incorporating multiple measurement modes. Yeah. So, right. Whenever one fails, you can back it up in a way with one that can catch that that variation. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Maybe a multivalence can correct those models. Cool. That's great. very insightful. And then uh, the next question probably for uh, Kimpa uh, would be, uh, so. I noticed those are uh, very impressive uh, implantable devices. And uh, uh, I imagine besides uh, designing or improving the sensing performance, then the uh, bio compatibility and the encapsulation of those devices uh, become another uh, important factors. Uh, I wonder uh, what special techniques uh, have you implemented for your devices in order to uh, ensure the bio compatibilities and uh, uh, encapsulations for your devices uh, published. Okay, uh, that is very good question. Um, in in my flight, I use um, very simplified illustration, but in the actual device, there is seven layers of paneling and PDMS. It means we have fourteen layers of We have fourteen layers of silicon substrate to increase the lifespan of the ink layer. So mm -hmm. it it took almost 24 hours to make one, one encapsulation yeah. layer. Wow, it, uh, why it has to be 14? So uh, how, how <laughs> did you uh, reach that number of uh, layers? Uh, what, what was the process? Oh, we did soap testing. So I put oh. the device in the saline solution at the 80 Celsius <laughs> degree and then uh -huh. checked the lifespan of the encapsulation. I see. Yeah, well, it's amazing to have fourteen layers in total for encapsulation. You you code PDMS and Perlin alternatively. That takes maybe <laughs> several weeks, right? So one fun. layer takes one day. <laughs> you have fourteen layers. Yeah. Actually, Professor Sang Min Won at Hongkyunggan University and Dr. Jong Woo Kim at Northwestern in the Rogers Group helped to make those encapsulation layers. I want to thank them. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah, that's very professional on that. Cool. 
then uh yeah the next question will be uh for uh, Alina will be uh and the uh the devices uh, is a steam attachment and uh, then uh how do you uh, uh comments on the air permittivities of uh, those devices uh uh so uh for for the uh, units then uh how to uh deploy um, use or maybe uh the uh, operation of the device in order uh, to um, mitigate uh, potential uh, associated with air permittivity if if there's are yeah yeah that's actually a very very good question i'm glad that you brought it up so um so first of all and um, for for skin ad ad adherence um having air pocket it's definitely something that um, will not only create um, inconsistency with your measurement signals, but also um, if you have your air pocket, then that also means that um, your signal sensitivity might also uh, decrease. And so um, we do two measures. The first thing is that um, we use our adhesive is actually a hydrogel adhesive layer that um, covers um, the whole sensor unit so that it can directly do um, adhesion onto the skin. And so you can imagine it is our sensor and then and then the hydrogel layer and then the skin. But on top of that, um, just to make sure that we do not have any air pockets, we also actually add a layer of PDMS um, or to, uh, to flatten out any gaps uh, between the, sen the uh, within the sensing unit so that there is a PDMS layer that actually ensures the flattening of um of the whole sensor unit um to just fill in gaps and then there is on top of that there is a hydrogel layer to ensure that there are no um air gaps in between got it yeah i see so, so the device uh, it looks uh fancy and simple on the slides but there's a more much more details uh behind it and, uh, as always right <laughs> yeah, to, to ensure the, the performance so probably Many more people is getting more and those uh, figure out those details. And then uh, probably the, the next question will be uh, uh, also uh, for for Alina and Dan is uh, the optical sensors. Uh, so uh, we we see uh, the penetration of uh, the light uh, uh, also wavelength dependent. I, I saw uh, some of the Alina sensor using four LEDs uh, instead of single one. And then uh, uh, Dan has using uh, multiple videos. I, I wonder uh, what will be the uh, uh, design. Uh, uh, consideration of the photo detectors in terms of, uh, uh, for example, the distance between the LED and also whether it's a reflective mode or uh, is a transmission mode. How would you uh, consider those uh, design factors? Yeah, so for our case, it's actually a balance between how many photons you can get into the photo detector, so how much signal you can actually get versus um, how deep of a signal that you want to get. So for example, um, in our slide, we did talk about, well, if you differ the distance uh, between your LED and your photo detector, you can, um, if you have a higher distance, then you can uh, indeed probe a deeper layer, which is what we wanted. But we also had a cap on that in terms of if you do a longer distance, that, that means that in our case, we are doing reflection mode. So um, so 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 in that case, in the reflection mode, the amount of photons that you can get if you have a longer distance is much much lower uh, than a shorter one. So you need to get enough number of photons in order to generate a valid signal to have a high signal to noise ratio. But at the same time, we also wanted to probe deep into the tissue. So there was a balance between uh, those two elements when we chose the distance. I see. Yeah. And would you like to comment additional? Sure. Um, no, I, I think Alina is absolutely correct. The the idea is, is, you know, for your application, how deep do you want to probe? And that can be very different depending. So on, on forehead applications, you're wanting to probe deeper into the brain and cerebral tissue, where, say, for, for my application with peripheral resistance, maybe the upper layers of the skin was significant enough. So in that case, you can afford maybe having a, a smaller source detector distance uh, in order to perform the application. And that also depends right on the wavelengths you use as well. So uh, ones that penetrate deeper, um, you can go farther distances and, and obtain an adequate signal with. Um, I'd say, you know, the, the, the limitation that you mentioned though is, is absolutely uh, one that's prevalent in the field. You know, the penetration depth 
is limited when it comes to this wavelength of light from blue visible light all the way out to infrared light. Um, and so I think that goes with the work that you know Kyung Kaha has been doing and and several others from the Rogers Lab where you're looking at implantable light sources, even yeah. yourself, again, right? Where you're trying to overcome that that limitation by bringing the light source itself into the tissue of of interest. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, I think so. Hi, uh, Wubin, can you uh, give me a chance to ask a general question for all the speakers? Yes, of course. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I noticed that all the speakers today uh, have done some work on wearable electronics or wearable sensors. And uh, I think most of the device use commercial chips or commercial sensors rather than the flexible devices that we fabricated in the clean room by ourselves. So uh, for example, for the wearable patch applied on neonates. So initially, the first paper published in Science used some microfabricated ultra-flexible devices. And then later for Alina's work, you changed it to some commercial devices, except the electrodes probably you fabricated by yourself, you still fabricated by yourself. So what is the reason that you change from those microfabricated ultra-flexible sensors to some commercial devices? Uh, so can you share your opinion on this? Is that just because we want to make it more robust or is there some other reasons? Yeah, so Mondi, you actually pinpointed the very exact reason why it was switched to the more commercialized version. It's indeed because of robustness. Now, the first, uh, the devices that were published in the first science paper, that was also based on an, an NFC powering which means that you actually need to power a main coil. And in that case, the main coil was the uh, was the neonatal crib. Um, so that means that the neonate actually, in order to detect um, the vital sign signal from the neonate, your recoil has to align with that um, with that main powering coil, right? The main powering and the, and the, and the data transmission coil. But the neonates, they, 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 they tend to move. Right. So there is no way to ensure that you can actually power it 24 seven. So if you look at the science paper, the duration, the signal, this, the data that they show the raw signal, that data, which that time window, if you look at closely at the X axis, it's within one minute because they couldn't get it to go longer. So that's exactly why in this system we switched it. So now it's um, so this system, it was more of a powdery a battery-based powering system. Um, and, um, and so with that, um, you know, then, 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 then we decided to use, if, since, since we're using a battery anyways, and eventual goal is to commercialize this thing. Then, so we use more sophisticated chips um, to, 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 to manufacture this. I see. Yeah. So uh, Kyung Ha and Dan, do you have any opinions to share for this question? Or I, I, I actually have a, another uh, question specifically for you two regarding the, the heart failure, uh, because I noticed that both Dan and Ken Ha done some work on heart failure, uh, but Dan used uh, some non-invasive approach, but Ken Ha implant a sensor in the blood vessel. So for Dan, uh, I think the hemodynamic is very important for patients with heart failure. Uh, so use some wearable approach to measure the, the blood pressure, which is uh, very important. But uh, <clears throat> there are some uh, clinical study that show that the blood pressure in pulmonary artery uh, is very important. Uh, uh, they can serve as an early indicator for the status of the heart failure. So Abbott, uh, a medical company, developed a product called CardioMAMS, I think Kyungha, uh, must know that uh, they, they implant the device into the pulmonary artery to continuously measure the blood pressure in the pulmonary artery. That blood pressure is different from the blood pressure in peripheral uh, vessels. So if you use light-based approach, you cannot go that deep into the pulmonary artery. Uh, so, uh, but if you implant a device into the pulmonary artery, you, you can precisely measure the pressure there. Uh, but uh, the disadvantage is that it's invasive. So, so I'm not sure if we want to, you know, manage the uh, manage the heart failure. Can we eventually use wearable approach, or do we must rely on some implantable device to measure the uh, conditions accurately? 
So what's your opinion on, on the many management of heart failure? Sure, I, I can go first. Um, I, I I guess I view it more as um, uh, both. I think will add considerably to the the quality of care of patients. It's, it's not. I don't think it's necessarily a one or the other thing when it comes to, like wearables or implants. As you said, right? Like the implant is is invasive, and and so the individual needs to be at a certain point in their heart failure progression to warrant the surgery in the first place. And so I I think that wearables will help in the earlier stages of heart failure more significantly where someone just has hypertension or has, you know, class one heart failure um, before it warrants the need for an invasive implant. And to your second point of whether or not a wearable will be able to provide the same value, say, as one of those implants, I think it's to be seen. Uh, You're certainly right that the pulmonary artery would be difficult to measure from a non-invasive external point of view, but there, there may be other correlates that help um, or, or other measurements that help correlate with the same outcomes as that, that pulmonary artery pressure. I see. Okay, so Kyung Ha, can you share your opinion? Um, in the case of my project, it was intended to verify the normal operation of an artificial heart valve. Since the plan was to integrate my system with this valve during transplantation, I conducted experiment on implanting it within blood vessels. Another reason is that comparing the pressure values in the left ventricle and arterium is required to determine if the heart valve opens and closes sufficiently. That's why I developed a version for implantation within the blood or ventricle. I see. And I also noticed your implantable device has uh, intravascular wires, right? Because the circuit is too large to be implanted into the blood mm-hmm. vessel. So you have an intravascular wire that connects your sensor to your circuit. So uh, I wonder what was the opinion from the clinicians on these intravascular wire? Um, actually, recently we've developed developed another um, another LC coil bars version, which does not require any circuit or wireless system. But clinician pl- prefer to use this Bluetooth low energy version to require the measurements at a higher sampling rate. So their purpose is to validate their artificial heart valve. That's why they require the higher sampling rate. I see. So, so that's for fundamental study, right? Not for a final clinical deployment. So they uh, right. they prefer a high sampling rate version rather than mm-hmm, the, the mm-hmm. fully implanted version. So I didn't know you already developed a fully implanted version using ASIC chip. Did, did I hear it correctly? Uh, no, you... there is no ASIC chip. It it consists of just Inductor, inductor and oh, the you, capacitance. That's why you can... use a similar mechanism with cardio MEMS. Yes, right. I see. I see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so Wubin, do you have any other questions? Yeah. Or maybe one more question uh, for Qingha is, uh, uh, so I see uh, the wireless communication modules, uh, some of devices you use uh, RF uh, um, module and, and others use uh, Bluetooth. So uh, how, how would you uh, 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 differentiate the uh, uh, characteristics between these two uh, wi- um, wireless communication modules and uh, in the different uh, scenarios? Oh, you mean difference between NFC and BLE versions? Yes, yeah, uh, in terms of uh, your, your devices. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, so if you don't want to use battery for safety, we need to use NFC version. But if you require higher data rate or long distance, we need to use BLE version. Got it. And uh, in, in terms of uh, their uh, uh, signal transmissions, uh, depths, uh, they perform similarly, or uh, one is uh, deeper than the other. So for the implantable devices. Uh, for implantable devices? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, for NFC version, we require larger coils to receive power from outside the body, which sometimes uh, leaves some 
comes on the organs or skin. So if we want to minimize the implantable devices, we prefer to use BLE, BLE version with the battery, and then we can wirelessly charging the battery. Thank you. Yeah. Uh... Okay, if you you do not have other question, I, I have another general question for, for, for all the speakers. So can I ask that if you you you, yes, you don't mind? Course. Yeah, I have a, another general question for the deployment of wearable devices onto patient subjects. So I, I noticed that all the speakers uh, demonstrated the deployment of wearable sensors on many patients, sometimes more than 100. So because we are doing research in, in labs, right? We are not a company. So when you uh, when you deploy those uh, large amounts of variable device to more than 100 patients, uh, did you rely on startups? Because I, I noticed that Kian Ha in the slides shows that he she collaborated with Verify to deploy those variable device onto patients. So the question is, did you all rely on startups in drones uh, uh, drones and startups to deploy those uh, wearable device or or you just uh, make those device by yourself. And uh, if you want to continue to do those similar kind of research, uh, but now as early career researchers, probably we don't have startups, how to continue with that kind of research? So can you share your opinion or thoughts on this? Yeah, so the for the devices that um, I presented, they were all made by hand, um, specifically my undergrads. <laughs> um, so, um, but I think eventually, though, um, if we want to deploy these devices to the consumer market, then you have to rely on startups or at least some type of automatic man um, automatic uh, automatic manufacturing modes. So, um, and then I think as, um, I think just for, if it's just for a publication purpose, then still making these devices by hand is still doable. And it's probably the most um, flexible because you can tune your design very easily. Um, whereas once you go into the automated system, just putting the tuning a small bit will will also take a lot of time. So if we're still in the design phase, then I still think making them by hand is the best. But once you're outside of the, the, the design phase, so for example, after our clinical pilot studies and we finalize our design, then I think that is the time when you move on to a startup and to mass production. I see, thank you. And yes. do you want to share some thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the devices that I had shown were created in collaboration with engineers at Seibel, one of the startup companies from uh, John Rogers Lab in Northwestern. And also critically, it was supported through the software applications developed by that company as well. So they, they basically forked or branched a version of their software to use and work for our devices, which was very uh, you know, uh, important to the whole process. Uh, I will say later on, um, we redeveloped some of the software internally within John's group uh, through Jake, Jacob Trueb. Um, but I think what your question is hits at a really uh, important point that in order for the devices to work on patients, a lot of the user system needs to be worked out, right? The, the data pipeline, how you're gonna configure the device in real time, because the patient doesn't have all day to be there for you to figure out what you're doing, right? <laughs> and, and so, uh, the way that we've been accommodating these needs is through collaborations with different um, software focused health centers. So the Center for Digital Therapeutics here at the University Health Network in Toronto is, is the, the entity that made Medley, that, that heart failure application that I've mentioned. And so it's, it's a, out of partnerships like that, that we've been able to create the software infrastructure to help support our wearables. And the whole idea is that that, that could then in, integrate with their larger, you know, heart failure programs later on. Yeah, thank you for sharing your thoughts. And 